Lucas. I was currently a senior lecturer at the University of Sheffield in the UK, and I guess not for long. It was uh, following the, the sun, and we ended up, guess what, in Australia. So, um, Jamil <coughs> Lucas got his PhD in 2011 at the University of Hanover, uh, and he was working mainly on semantic uh, search. And then he moved to the University of Fribourg, where he spent two or three years. Three years. Uh, three years, yeah. Working as a, a senior uh, researcher, and he was giving uh, some lectures here. And then he moved to the uh, University of uh, Sheffield for two years. And now he's moving again to Australia for another trip. Uh, yeah. So he uh, spent some time at the uh, University of uh, UC Berkeley. He worked a bit uh, at uh, Yahoo in Spain. So his main research interest, <laughs> interests are, of course, crowdsourcing, information retrieval, and uh, semantic web. And Gianluca is, and, uh, is, is publishing in top uh, tier conferences in his uh, fields. So uh, without further ado, uh, the floor is yours, Gianluca. Thanks again for your invitation. Thank you, Moran, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so the plan for today is uh, I'll try to do a mix of uh, lecture and research uh, talk. So, and this should uh, be something around uh, an hour or so. If you have any questions as we go, feel free to ask me anytime, that's fine. And I'll start with the general introduction of, uh, on uh, crowdsourcing and human computation. And then I'll tell you a bit uh, about few research works uh, we did uh, on uh, human factors in crowdsourcing. So before I start, uh, let me give you an overview of my research areas. Uh, as Murdo said, it's uh, in between uh, information retrieval, semantic web, and uh, crowdsourcing human computation. From a uh, uh, time point of view, so if you look at the time evolution of my research, I started uh, working on entity-centric information access uh, more than 10 years ago, where I, is, where I was uh, building search engines that use text and uh, structured data like databases and knowledge graphs to make uh, the results better and the user experience better. Then while I was a researcher here in Fribourg, we started to use crowdsourcing to build uh, what we call hybrid human machine systems. So we, the idea is to leverage the scalability of machines over large amounts of data, but also keep humans in the loop uh, to make sure that the quality of uh, the algorithms is uh, as good as possible. And I'll give you examples of these uh, type of systems. While we were bu building these systems uh, also here in Fribourg, we, are we realized how challenges how challenging it is to use crowdsourcing platforms because you actually, you can write a piece of code that it's asking questions to people online, getting the answers back and continuing with the execution. You are also paying these people. So if you have a bug in your code, it may be very dangerous and expensive. So while we were building this, you, we realized all the challenges. So more recently in the last three years, I really focused on making crowdsourcing platforms better. And better means in terms of uh, effectiveness, so by getting better quality data back from a crowdsourcing platform, but also efficiency. How do you scale, scale uh, crowdsourcing and make it uh, faster and uh, at large scale? Uh, because when you build these systems, obviously machines are much more scalable, faster, as compared to human um, individuals uh, providing data. Okay, so I'll give you, a, as I said, an introduction on crowdsourcing and human computation first, and then I'll try to focus on uh, our most recent uh, work on uh, the human dimension of uh, crowdsourcing platforms. All right, so let's start to see what uh, we mean with crowdsourcing. This is a picture taken in London by a CCTV camera. Uh, that's a red double-decker bus and there is a lot of people pushing the bus because there is a bicycle driver stuck below the bus. So all these people were pushing the bus to help uh, uh, rescue the person uh, which is under the bus, and that's a form of crowdsourcing. 
So more formally, let's start with the definition. What uh, do we mean with crowdsourcing? The first person uh, using the term crowdsourcing was uh, this guy uh, who wrote an article for Wired uh, in 2006. And he defines crowdsourcing as really uh, making an open call for contributions uh, from people. So obviously, it's the combination of the word outsourcing and crowd of people. So you outsource your problem openly to, uh, to everyone. And this problem can be solved either collaboratively, so people come together, they discuss, and they try to find a solution to a problem. And there are crowdsourcing projects that uh, try to solve very difficult problems like uh, sending the men to Mars or solving uh, um, outbreaks of a disease. And, and for that, people come together, they discuss, they share ideas, they try to find the best solution for these big challenges. You can also try to solve these problems individually. So you outsource your tasks uh, to a number of people that individually will solve the tasks. Uh, uh, but the idea is that you have very many of them and you can send it to very many people and then you collect the answers back. The typical approach is that you always want to reach a large number of potential contributors uh, or collaborators or workers are we, as we are going to call them. So this is the idea of crowdsourcing. You have a problem and you make an open call and you ask for help to find a solution. That's very, a very broad definition and indeed crowdsourcing is used to define many different things. So the first thing uh, you should ask if you want to use crowdsourcing is why these people should help solve your problem. And if you want people help solving your problem, you need to find the right incentives for these people helping you. So you can have different type of incentives uh, which, with which you can motivate the crowd to solve your problem. You can use uh, extrinsic uh, uh, incentives, uh, and we'll see the example of paid crowdsourcing. Basically, you pay a small monetary reward uh, uh, to each contributor solving one of your tasks uh, in exchange of doing the task. And then you collect uh, the answers back uh, and you give the money to these people. This is the main type of uh, crowdsourcing I'm focusing on. Of course, it comes with uh, advantages and disadvantages, as we will see. But you can also uh, leverage intrinsic motivation of people. Uh, the classic example is Wikipedia. Wikipedia is an open uh, encyclopedia collaboratively created online of very high quality. And all col most of the collaborators are not uh, uh, rewarded for the time and contributions they make in an uh, explicit uh, uh, fashion, right? They really do it to help the community to gain visibility within the community rather than getting money out of it. So that's the... Um, main example of crowdsourcing which is not paid. But you can also think of uh, games with a purpose where uh, players of a game, they play the game to have fun, to spend the time on playing the game, but as a side effect of the game, they generate data. And a classic example is the ESP game where you were supposed to provide tags of an image and the tag was accepted only if another player at the same time was typing the same tag. So it is a sure you uh, honestly try to tag uh, the image as good as possible. You get point if you agree with the other worker. And as a side effect, you get a large collection of images which are tagged. And you don't need to pay people because they just play a game. Other examples uh, are citizen science projects. So you may have uh, heard of uh, Galaxy Zoo, where the original task was uh, I show you pictures taken by a telescope in space and you tell me which type of uh, galaxy this uh, picture is about. So it's a classic uh, uh, classification problem. Given an image, assign it to multi one of uh, multiple predefined classes. And of course, you can use this data to train a supervised machine learning model to automatically classify galaxies uh, into few uh, classes. People were doing this manual effort to help uh, uh, research in astrophysics, not for any other reason. 
Uh, it was not particularly fun or it was not a competition. They were not paid money to do it. They were just trying to help science. So there are many examples of uh, crowdsourcing, as we have seen, and there are different types of incentives we may use uh, to, have to ask for help to a crowd of individuals, typically online, to solve our problems. Uh, or more specifically for the type of crowdsourcing we are talking about today, to label or process our data. We will have a large data set. We need uh, manual uh, labeling of the data. So we crowdsource this uh, uh, to human individuals online. All right, so when we take uh, the definition of, of crowdsourcing that really looks at data and data processing and data labeling, uh, uh, we can start to talk about human computation. So it's really solving a computational problems using human intelligence by means of crowdsourcing this data to people online. So when we do human computation, we have a number of questions to answer. Uh, what is that we outsource to a crowd of people? Which data? So let's assume we have a web crawl of billions of web pages and we want to identify uh, or classify the sentiment of a web page uh, manually. We cannot physically crowdsource uh, 100 billion documents, so we need to select which uh, subset of our large data set to crowdsource. We need to ask who is the crowd? Do we need uh, experts on specific topics? Do we need, uh, um, I don't know, movie experts to classify our movie data set, or we just need uh, the only requirement is that you need to be human. So you need to be able to look at an image and understand the content. Uh, that's another question that uh, we need to answer before crowdsourcing our data. And then how does the task, uh, so how do we ask the question to this crowd of people? We need to design a task, which is typically a web form, HTML, that they will need to uh, go over, right? The, we will show our data item, maybe a picture, a tweet, uh, a news article, and then we'll have some input area where they contribute. They classify a tweet in being uh, positive or negative. They tell us whether it is uh, um, a movie, is uh, sci-fi, or it's a drama movie, and so on. Then the big question about uh, quality, right? We ask these questions, we get the answers back, but can we actually trust uh, the answers we get back uh, from, uh, from the crowd? And here there is a lot of work in uh, really making sure to validate uh, the results we get back from the crowd, right? So you can use uh, any sort of statistical techniques. Uh, the most simple is you ask multiple people and you see whether they give the same answer or not to your question. So rather than asking just one and trusting uh, the answer you get, uh, you ask multiple people and then you aggregate uh, these answers, uh, uh, assuming you get a more reliable label for your data. And so on, and then optimization, so which incentives, how do you motivate people to, to contribute and contribute uh, for a long time? Uh, how can you... Um, give the right task to the right worker in the crowd? Can we do a matchmaking? Can we um, train workers to become better over time? And so on. So, so there are many questions on uh, uh, making this crowdsourcing process better. All right, so let's uh, uh, try to focus a bit. Uh, out of all these crowdsourcing type of projects, uh, let's focus on paid uh, microtask crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing, we understand what it means. Uh, Microtask crowdsourcing means the task we ask the crowd to solve is very simple. I show you a tweet, tell me positive or negative. It may take a uh, few seconds to a couple of minutes to solve. It's not uh, a task like uh, uh, tell me how to send a man to Mars, which takes 10, 20 years to solve. So it's very simple tasks for which uh, humans are very good uh, at but uh, computers and machines are still, uh, algorithms are still uh, uh, lacking behind in terms of uh, uh, quality of the results. And then it's paid. So the incentive we are using here is monetary. We are gonna pay people to complete these micro tasks. The reason we are doing this is 
because the task itself may not be particularly fun or there may not be a community incentive uh, that we can leverage for, so if we cannot do that, all we can do is pay people to do it. So we are going to pay a small monetary reward for each of the micro tasks which is being completed by these people. And each uh, person in the crowd, which we call worker, can decide to complete one or many tasks uh, available to them. To do this, we have luckily platforms on the web which serve as a meeting point between requesters who have data and tasks to publish and money to spend and workers who can uh, who are members of the crowd come to the platform and complete tasks uh, and uh, collect the monetary reward attached uh, to the task. The tasks, we call them human intelligence tasks uh, or its, and we can publish a batch of tasks uh, on this platform. So let's imagine we have a thousand tweets. We want to manually label them into positive or negative. We create a batch of 1,000 eats on the platform as a requester. We pay, uh, we attach some money to the tasks and then workers arrive and they can complete one to 1,000 tasks and get the money attached to the tasks. Okay, so this is paid micro task crowdsourcing. As I said, there are platforms. This is the main, uh, the main platform currently available, which has been developed by Amazon and it's called Amazon Mechanical Turk. This is what you see on the home page. If you log in on the right, you are a requester, you get results. You can put your data there and you will get labels back. If you log in on the left, you can, as they say, make money. So you are a member of the crowd. You can complete tasks, give your answers and get the money back. This was first developed by Amazon about uh, 10, 12 years ago because first they needed this, right? The first task they crowdsourced was Given a product uh, we sell on Amazon.com, we need to categorize it in uh, uh, electronics, uh, sport, uh, leisure, and whatever category structure they had. So they had to, at scale, manually assign a product to a category. So they build uh, the crowdsourcing platform. Today, Mechanical Turk is really a marketplace for it. So it's, as we said, it's the place where requesters and workers meet, but it's a market because you assign a value to a task, and as a requester, you are competing with other requesters, publishing other tasks for another amount of money. So you want workers to do your tasks, but the worker is choosing which task to work on. When you log in as a worker, you will see a long list of tasks like this, and then you decide as a worker in the crowd which task to do. You, don't, you cannot read, but for example, this task is paid 8 cent of US dollar if you do one of them, and you can do 6,000 of them if you want. So it's really a marketplace. You are competing for attention of the workers, and workers can decide what to work on. This is one example of a task, uh, which was this morning on Mechanical Turk. Uh, you are shown some information about the company, a link to Google search, with the name of the company directly. And what your task is, is to type in the street address of that company. So the task is, I tell you which company I'm looking for, go on the web and find the physical address of the headquarters of this company, come back, type it here, and I give you 15 cents of US dollars. So now the worker decision is, is this worth it or not 15 cents to do or not? And also, if I do 100 of them, am I getting faster so my hourly rate is increasing over time? Is this something I'm gonna invest into or not? And on the other side, we are collecting a large data set of company addresses that we may use to send the marketing material or so. Another example which is common is uh, you get a picture of a receipt or a PDF of a receipt and you need to transcribe it here filling a form. So you need to go from uh, a document or an image to some structured data that uh, is described in this uh, data item, in this image. Again, this is manual effort, data entry, but at scale if you have a million of images of receipts, uh, you can uh, digitize and have a structured database automatically created by and by many people. 
Okay, so this is Mechanical Turk. Uh, we did, uh, uh, in collaboration here with uh, Freiburg, people in Freiburg, a study on how Mechanical Turk is used uh, over five years. These are the top requesters. So requesters who publish tasks and attach money for, to tasks uh, on Mechanical Turk uh, over one month last year. This is ordered by the amount of money, the reward that they are attaching to tasks. The first one, which is called SpeechPad, over one month uh, publish uh, crowdsourcing tasks for $100,000. Uh, so what Sp SpeechPad does, it's a company that provides audio transcription services. You give them an audio file and they give you back uh, the text uh, Transcri uh, transcription of the audio file, of the speech in the audio file. How they do it? They take your audio file, they split it into chunks of uh, 20, 30 seconds, and they send it to Mechanical Turk. Someone on Mechanical Turk will transcribe the audio file, they collect the answers together, and they give it back to you, and of course they make money on top. So that's one popular task on uh, Mechanical Turk. Uh, uh, we did a few analyses, so we look at which, where the workers come from or where uh, um, requesters want workers from. And the most requested country are United States and India. That's also where uh, most workers are based on Mechanical Turk. And we looked at the time evolution of uh, uh, this data. So you see that United States has been the most uh, uh, desire the type of worker all the time, while other worker population change. For example, India was popular a few years ago, but then it started to go down. Uh, and this may be because of many reasons, right? We, we assume that the quality of the work provided by uh, workers based in India has been decreasing, and that's why they were requested less. But it is just what the data shows. We did a lot of analysis. I'm just going to show you a, a couple of them. The interesting one is how much tasks are paid. So on the left, you see the evolution over time of the reward attached to tasks. You see that in 2011, the most popular reward level was one cent of US dollar, while in uh, 2013, uh, the most popular reward level was five cents of US dollar. So this doesn't tell us anything about how much work is paid, right? It depends what the task is really, to say that it's paid well or not. But we see that at least tasks are getting paid more, and this may mean that the tasks are becoming slightly more complex over time, because they are rewarded more, so they may request for more contributions. Overall, if you look at the entire Mechanical Turk market, you see that the reward available on the market over time is increasing, and that's a, a healthy sign of uh, the platform itself, because there is more work, more money available for workers on the crowd. All right, so these are paid micro-task crowdsourcing platforms. Let's see how we can use these uh, crowdsourcing platforms to build uh, systems. That's something I told you at the beginning, right? Uh, we, we have been building hybrid human machine systems that uh, leverage machines to scale and uh, use crowdsourcing to uh, help the machines and the algorithms to do their job. So if you want to make this combination, you have uh, two main options. You can use crowdsourcing as a pre-processing before the algorithm or as a post-processing after the algorithm. For example, you have a supervised machine learning model. To, to build that, you need training data. So you use crowdsourcing as pre-processing. You send your 1,000 tweets to Mechanical Turk. You get labels back. And then you train a machine learning model to classify tweets automatically. And then you classify your uh, 20 billion tweets without paying uh, for every single tweet, right? That's the classic example. You can also use crowdsourcing as a post-processing. So let me give you an example of that. This is an early hybrid system for image search. So here the task, the, what the system does is uh, uh, I give you an image and the system gives me back similar images. It's a classic image search, uh, query by example type of system. 
and you can build these purely machine-based, right? So you build a system where the query is an image, and then as a result, you get a ranked list of images which are visually similar to that. You can use color histogram and stuff like that. But now you can use crowdsourcing as a post-processing to improve the quality of the results. So you take top K results from the search engine. For example, here you take top four, you send it to Mechanical Turk, you ask five workers in the crowd, is this a good match for this query image, yes or no? And then you decide. So the first one, five people out of five said yes, so you are going to keep this as first result. Here, for this image, five people out of five said it's not a good result, so you can also remove it out of the result list. And then you go back to your user who issued the query, and you give it a better uh, result for their search query. So here you build a human uh, a hybrid system that is using uh, first machines to index a lot of images and retrieve only K of them. And then you crowdsource only K uh, to make the quality better. Another example of uh, hybrid human machine system is CrowdDB, which is a database with the crowd inside. So you know how a database works. This database is sometimes asking questions to a crowd to answer a SQL query. The specific way it's using the crowd here is, for example, to find missing data. Assume you have a customer table in your database and you don't have the phone number for a specific customer. A user of the database issues a query, give me all the phone numbers of the customer based in uh, Boston. And for some of them, you don't have this uh, value in the table. So you can crowdsource a task like the ones we saw before for the address. Find me the phone number of this uh, uh, customer, which may be a person or a company. You get the answers back from Mechanical Turk, and then you give the answers back to the user who issued the SQL query. We also use crowdsourcing for uh, making comparisons. So you could have a SQL operator, which is sort by, um, no, okay, give me only uh, mail customers but you only have the first name, last name, but you don't have a column saying what is the gender of the customer, but still you can answer a SQL query, give me only customers uh, uh, who are male, by crowdsourcing this additional column where you show the data you have, and you add one additional column to your table, which is gender, and then you answer your SQL query uh, normally, and so on. So you can use the crowd to uh, enrich, uh, add values to the database, uh, correct values, make joins, uh, and so on and so forth. So you try to combine uh, um, machines and humans in the best possible way. The last example I give you about the hybrid system is one we built uh, here in Freiburg, which is called uh, ZenCrowd. So this system does entity linking. Uh, let's look at it as a black box. The input of these are web pages, let's say news articles. And the uh, uh, output of these are the same news articles with entities like persons, location, and organizations identified in the news articles and uniquely disambiguated to a, a knowledge graph or a database you have in the background. So what we need to do here is to parse the text of the document, extract these uh, uh, entities, and then create a link to the database that contains a structured description of these entities. We can do this completely um, automatically. We can use algorithms from NLP, machine learning, to make all this automatic. But what we are doing here, we are using crowdsourcing as post-processing. So we first run all our uh, entity extraction, entity linking, uh, algorithms which are machine-based uh, automatically. But then instead of stopping here and producing the output, we go to a crowdsourcing platform and we ask uh, to double check the results of the algorithm. So because we, like before, we don't want to crowdsource every possible document and every possible entity, 
we use the confidence level of the algorithm to decide which entity to send to the crowd and which not. So we are going to trust the algorithm when the confidence of the algorithm is high, and we are going to ask the crowd when the algorithm is uncertain about the decision. What we do here is uh, we then take the answers back uh, from the crowdsourcing platform and we use a probabilistic network to combine the answer given by the algorithms and the answers given by all the crowd workers we asked uh, the questions to. We aggregate these probabilistically, so we are going to learn over time uh, which workers we trust more than others, and then we produce as a final output uh, uh, the result of this combination. And this gives a better quality uh, result uh, as compared to just using uh, machine-based algorithms. Okay, so this was uh, a bit of a very quick uh, overview of uh, crowdsourcing, uh, specifically focusing on human computation and paid micro-task crowdsourcing, how we can use it to build systems that uh, scale thanks to machines, but can also do very uh, interesting things thanks to uh, humans uh, in the loop. So we saw crowdsourcing is growing in popularity. Both industry and academia are using crowdsourcing to build uh, these type of systems, to collect uh, labels for data sets and so on. Uh, and there are very many applications uh, uh, in which we can use this uh, approach and build these systems. Okay, so it looks all good, uh, although it's not. When you try to do this, uh, the first time you try to use crowdsourcing, you say, okay, it doesn't work. All the answers I get back are super bad because I'm paying people, they just want the money, they don't want to answer my questions, so the quality is very low. And that's what everyone experience is. So what you need to do is to make sure you do some, you follow certain steps to make sure that the quality of the data you get back is right. So you mainly have two questions, right? How you, we make sure that the data quality you get back is high, and that's an effectiveness question, but also how you optimize efficiency of crowdsourcing, both in terms of the cost, because we are paying money, so how can we uh, be optimal in the terms of the subset of the data set we crowdsource and we pay for, and also how long are we gonna wait for all the crowd workers to answer my question so I can keep doing my uh, training or whatever the algorithm is doing. Okay. So, any questions so far? Very good question. Okay, so here what happens is the user is sending a query and now waiting, waiting for the results because we are going to the crowd, the crowd is taking its time to answer, we collect the answers and then we go back to the user and this may take more than a few hundred milliseconds. So that's true, right? There is an efficiency bottleneck which is the crowd. Humans are slower than the computational speed of machines so we need to decide how to use this properly. There are few research work on trying to make crowdsourcing real time, so really go to the crowd, wait two seconds, come back and go back to the user, so now the latency may be five seconds overall, which may be acceptable, but more generally, you use crowdsourcing offline, right? You build a training data set, you train a model, or you pre-process uh, data, you don't make users wait for the crowd to finish. So you try to use it uh, offline at indexing time uh, uh, because it will take some time. Any other question? Yes. So how are the workers chosen? In principle, there is no selection criteria. In principle, everyone can subscribe and register to the platform as a worker and then the worker decides what those tasks to complete. So it's not the requester who decides I want this worker or that worker, but it's the worker which comes to the task. 
that's the standard. And then there are variants in which, uh, for example, on Mechanical Turk, not everyone is allowed to be a worker, but th that's an Amazon decision. You have also systems that allow you to assign tasks to people. So it's the requester who is pushing tasks to workers in the crowd based on whatever information they have, being these uh, historical data on previous tasks the worker did or uh, any user profile you can build of the worker. So for example, we use the uh, Facebook likes to decide uh, on task assignment. And the short story there is that uh, if the task is, uh, tell me the name of this football player, if you assign it to any random uh, worker on Mechanical Turk, they will do this good. But if you assign it to a worker who likes many football teams and football players on Facebook, he will be super good. So you can leverage information about the workers to assign tasks to the workers, and they will perform better if they have an expertise or an interest in the task topic. Yes? Yes, that's 30% today. So if you pay $1 to a worker, you pay $1.30 overall, and 30 cents goes to mechanical work. And do you have any other alternative alternatives in Mechanical Turk for this question? Um, the same amount of value? So yes, there are alternatives. Uh, I would say Mechanical Turk is the most popular. The second most popular is called Crowdflower, and it's the same fee level, 30%. There are cheaper, but probably lower quality, lower type of service platforms that are around. Any other question? All right. So let me move to um, an overview of few research works we did. I'll try to keep it short, uh, but I'll try to give you the main messages out of this. So this is uh, a few papers we did uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, and here the main question is uh, what we just said, right? How we can make sure that the quality of the data we get back uh, from the crowdsourcing platform is good. So the first piece of work is uh, we looked at how certain workers uh, try to get the monetary reward attached to the task without necessarily answering uh, correctly the questions we ask. So if you think how to attack a crowdsourcing platform and get the money out of it, what you are seeing is a web form with some input fields. So what you make sure is you, you enter some values in the input fields and you submit the form and you will get the money if you don't want to really answer the question. So we look at uh, which techniques uh, uh, people use uh, to, to do this. Then we looked at uh, how we can play with the limit on the task uh, uh, deadline in a way. So I, I ask you to annotate a tweet in positive and negative, but I only give you 10 seconds. And we looked at the fact of doing that and then we try to measure what it means uh, uh, for a task to be easy or more complex based on task features. Okay, so let me start with the first one, which is uh, uh, techniques used by workers to really attack a task. So quality control in paid crowdsourcing is the main uh, challenge when you use paid crowdsourcing because there are adversaries who want to take the monetary reward without providing quality answers back. Workers are very many, they come from different backgrounds, they have different uh, motivations. For example, studies show that uh, uh, workers based in the United States, they typically do it to kill free time in the evening, while workers uh, based in India, they do it eight, 10 hours a day as a full-time job and they get a salary at the end of the month. So the, the, the reasons why people do it is very different and this has an effect on the behaviors they have. How the, the basic way to measure quality is using gold standard questions. For example, a task is asking you to label 10 tweets into positive or negative, and for a small sample of your data, you have the correct label, but you still crowdsource it. 
So one out of 10 tweets, uh, you know that's a positive tweet, uh, and you check on this one if the workers are actually agreeing, uh, telling you the, the right answer. If they do, you trust all the other nine labels. If they don't, uh, you may discard all the others because they are kind of not uh, providing the right answers on the small subset you know the answer for. So that's a gold standard question, right? Of course, if you have all the answers, you don't need to crowdsource it. Uh, if you have nothing, you can make no quality check because you don't know what is the right answer. So the idea is to have a small percentage of your questions for which you have the right answer and you use this to check the worker answer. So here, what we wanted to check is uh, which methods uh, uh, these untrustworthy workers use uh, to complete tasks. Uh, and we specifically looked at uh, surveys. Uh, so I'll, I'll explain you which task we used here. And we also used it, uh, we looked at how these patterns can be identified and quantified in the crowd. So let me tell you about the experiment. Uh, we looked at surveys, so a survey is really a list of questions uh, which may collect the demographics data, uh, like uh, how old are you, where you live, uh, uh, education level, salary level, and so on, plus additional questions, and this is commonly used in the social sciences to make studies, right? Uh, may be related to psychology questions and so on. It's just a questionnaire, and you ask a thousand people to answer it, and then you analyze the, the data and you draw conclusions out of that. Surveys are very difficult to uh, quality check because you don't necessarily have a gold answer for all the questions, right? You typically ask for an opinion, right? What would you do in this situation? There is no right answer, it really depends. So we, that's why we really look at surveys and we try to see how uh, these low quality workers answer in these questions. We asked the 1,000 workers to answer our survey, and then we manually looked at the answers they provide. And we define a set of categories of uh, low quality behaviors that we observed. For example, um, the smart deceivers type of workers are the ones that uh, if you ask, uh, uh, if the task is I show you an image, uh, give me five tags for this image separated by a comma. They will type in the text area something like one, comma, two, comma, three, comma, four, comma, five. Why they do this? On one end, they are assuming there may be some JavaScript check that it's looking at the syntax and expecting five tokens with a comma after each token. But still, and that's why they type that, but still typing one, two, three, four, five is less expensive for them. It takes less time to think about five semantic stacks that really reflect the meaning of the image you are showing them. So they try not to be spotted by any automatic check, uh, but they are also not providing uh, quality answers. And so on, so we identify different techniques uh, these workers use uh, to uh, not provide the right answer. For example, simply randomly typing characters on the keyboard uh, just to fill something in, the, in all the input fields you have. And then they submit this. So based on the answers they gave, we defined these categories of workers. We have a question? Yes. Right. Um, so what uh, most platforms uh, allow you to do is uh, if you identify a worker is bad, you can uh, report it to the platform and block it for your future tasks. So this worker is not allowed to work for your task ever again that you can do. And then the platform may decide if, uh, I don't know, five different requesters have reported this worker, we actually ban it from the platform that may happen. And there's no, uh, there's no way to give like a star rating to just select users or they were selected? The, as far as I know, platforms don't allow you to do that. Um, 
but uh, it's uh, even if that would be available, it's very difficult, right? Because if you crowdsource it and you recruit a thousand workers, it's difficult to then feed back for each worker what is the quality level back to the plot. There is no incentive for the requester to do that. You could, yes. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, so uh, there is not much that uh, in that direction yet, but it would be super interesting to have uh, this information and this can build up a profile of a worker and then over time you can be a good worker. Uh, if you build your curriculum in a way, then you can get more work. Uh, so that's a very good direction to look yeah, at. Perhaps we can make things more scalable. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You should really see a career path, right? If I'm doing good job, I should get uh, paid more, get more jobs, and so on. But it's not there yet, I guess. Right, so these are good workers, uh, but they fail to answer this one out of 10 question uh, that we are checking against. Uh, against. So, probably, yeah, no, no, they are good. So on average, they uh, give very accurate answers, but they fail the gold one. So if we don't know about the rest, we are gonna discard them because we only look at the gold, right? So that's uh, this type of work. Any other question? Yes. Very good question. Um, so of course, the more workers work on the same task, the more reliable uh, answer you will get at the end, but the more you need to pay because you need to pay every worker. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so the, the tasks are on the platform and any worker from any country, any time can come and do it. Um, so the platform does not allow you to do that, but workers kind of self-organized and they have uh, web forums where they have uh, discussions on tasks and requesters among themselves, but it's uh, self-organized by the workers. By default, the platform will see workers as independent contributors and there is no exchange among them. Any other question? All right. So let me just show you uh, one slide about this data set we collected about the different type of uh, low quality workers. Um, so what we see is that uh, these fast deceivers, that is the one that uh, type any uh, thing on the keyboard to, to very quickly finish the task are the most popular. But also you have these uh, rule breakers that uh, do not uh, adhere to the instructions you give. So if you in the instructions at the beginning of a task you ask them to do something, they will not respect uh, these rules and these are also low quality workers. We can then distinguish between the workers who actually answer our gold question correctly and those who didn't answer the gold question correctly. So all these are anyway low quality workers, but still you have low quality that passed the gold and low quality that didn't pass the gold. Um, and you see that uh, rule breakers are actually very good in answering the gold question correctly and very badly answering all the rest. So they intentionally try to spot your uh, the question where you are checking for quality, they do that correctly, and then the rest they just fill very quickly uh, to get the money. And so on, so there are many analyses we did, uh, uh, which I'm not going over. The only additional finding we had here, which is fairly interesting, is what we call tipping point. So what we observe is this, this low quality worker as they go along a long task, they start providing uh, good quality answers and at a certain point they decide, okay, uh, it's too long or the, it's not worth the money I'm getting. So they will just uh, start to use one of these behaviors to become low quality and finish the task and get the money. 
And these tipping points, so the point in the task where they become low quality, varies uh, 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 between different type of work. It was uh, easy, right? So it was more an attention check question where if you read the questions, you can understand that's used to check for quality rather than any other question. Okay, uh, so out of this study, the main outcome is a set of guidelines we created for requesters in designing tasks to make sure you can get uh, uh, these low quality workers identified uh, and managed. For example, for fast uh, deceivers and rule breakers, you can use uh, validators, right? You can have syntactic checks in JavaScript that look at the length uh, of the answer or how much time they spend doing the task. Uh, and if it doesn't match your requirement, uh, you can report the worker, block it, uh, don't allow them to submit and whatever you want. Um, for the smart deceivers, which are the very difficult ones, right? The 1, 2, 3, 4 type of answers, that's very difficult to spot automatically. So what we uh, have been trying there is to use uh, uh, psychometric approaches. So the idea is that you ask the same questions twice in the task uh, and you check if they answer the same. If they don't, uh, something may be wrong. If they do agree with themselves on the same question over 30 seconds, then maybe they are, uh, you can trust their answers. Okay. So given uh, any question on this. All right. So given the time, I'm going to talk about this uh, only, and I will skip the last, uh, which was about complexity. So let me tell you about uh, um, the time. So we have a crowdsourcing task. And as we said uh, at the beginning, this may take uh, uh, five, 10 seconds or a couple of minutes as it's a micro task. So the question here we add in this uh, piece of research is can we limit the task available to workers to complete the task? Uh, and what's the effect of that? The task, the crowdsourcing task we looked uh, here is uh, relevance judgment. So the task is the following. We show to a worker a search query that you would uh, uh, type in Google and a document, a web page, which is a result of that search. And then we ask the worker, is this document relevant to the query I show you? Is it partially relevant or it's not relevant at all? It doesn't match the query. So that's the task. We show a query a document and we have a multiple choice question uh, about the relevance of the document to the query. Right, and we design the task as following. So this is more or less the task. Av after a specific time, the document disappears and the worker has to answer. And then we were playing with this timeout, right? After how much time we make the document disappear how uh, good the relevance label is for the document. So this is the main research question we were trying to answer, right? If we limit the time to the task and we assume we pay workers for the time they spend, it means we can pay less the worker if there is less time needed to complete the task. So if you need to crowdsource a lot of query document pairs and get relevance labels, if you reduce the time for each of the documents, can we pay less money overall? So our hypothesis here is yes, of course, if we limit the time, we pay less, we pay less money overall, but we have some quality loss, right? If we reduce to an extreme and we show the documents for one second, it will be random, the label. So here we were looking to find the right trade-off between the money and the quality that we are spending. We run a few experiments. Uh, the first one is the classic task, unbound time. I show you the document, take your time, and give me the answer. So here the workers are free 
to use all the time they want. Of course, they want to optimize the time because they are trying to get the money. They want to reduce the time anyhow. But we don't put any block on that. Then we started to play with this document disappearing setting where we show the document for three seconds, seven seconds, 15 and 30 seconds. And we see how the quality varies. Okay, so let me start with this. So the first one, unbounded. The workers can take the time they want and this is what happens, right? You have uh, workers that more or less spend uh, some uh, 10, 30 seconds, but then you have this long tail of workers who take uh, one hour to do the task. And that's just because they start the task and they, they go make a coffee, they go out for lunch, they come back and they finish the task uh, three hours later. So there is uh, this large uh, uh, interval of uh, task time. The other things we observed, if we ask a worker to do eight documents in a row, the first document will take longer, long, longer time as compared to the others. This is a classic training effect, right? If you do a task for the first time, you read the instructions, you try to understand what you have to do, and it will take a bit more time. Once you have done it once, you will become much faster afterwards. Okay, so looking at this data of uh, letting workers take the time they want uh, and uh, comparing it uh, with the quality. So you have quality here on the y-axis and how much time they took to do the task. So what we see here is that if they took very little time, the quality is kind of low. So you know that very fast workers are typically low quality worker and you can put the minimum uh, time desired for the task. But also if they take too long, uh, the quality doesn't necessarily go high, right? So it stays the same. So we found a nice window between five and 30 seconds for our task uh, to provide good quality answers. So we started to define our timeout, uh, as I said, three, seven, 15 and 30 seconds. So this is what we did. We make the document disappear after uh, the timeout and we ask uh, them to give an answer uh, whenever they want. And this is what happens. So here you have the different settings. This is three seconds, seven, 15 and 30 seconds. The red line is the, the timeout and uh, the box plot is the time the workers took to make the judgment. So here, after three seconds, the document disappear, and after a couple of seconds, they give an answer. So they look at the document, then it disappears, and they need to guess. Same here, after seven seconds, they answer a couple of seconds after, and with 15 and 30, they start to answer before the timeout. So they consider the time available to be enough, and they answer even before the time is over. Okay, so we repeated then the first experiment using uh, 15 and 30 seconds, which appear to be the time which is enough uh, uh, to judge a document for this specific task. Uh, and what we observed uh, by repeating the first experiment is that uh, using 15 seconds timeout, uh, you get better quality judgments as compared to 30 seconds, but also as compared to no timeout at all, which was the first uh, standard setting we used. And that was a bit surprising, right? We were, our hypothesis at, at the beginning was the more time we l give them, the more we spend money, but the better quality we get. But this result shows that actually with 15 seconds, you can pay less than 30 seconds and get a better quality results. So our hypothesis was actually wrong, right? We, we cannot just reduce the cost of getting labels, but we can actually improve the quality of the labels we collect, which was a surprising, interesting result. So the final experiment we did uh, after this is uh, um, how 
can we optimize uh, given a budget? So let's say we have a thousand documents to crowdsource and we have $10 to spend. We have many options now, right? We can ask uh, three workers uh, to judge our documents and let them take the time they want. Or we can reduce the time and ask 10 workers to judge the same document and this may give us a better quality label at the end. So we did for the same budget a uh, different combination of how, what is the timeout. For example, for six uh, seconds timeout, uh, you can ask 25 workers spending the same money as compared to having a 50 seconds maximum time and asking three workers the same document. So what is giving you the better quality for the same money you are spending? And uh, it is the result. So on the y-axis, you have the quality of the label and here you have the timeout you are using. Again, here we are spending the same money because for short timeouts we are asking more workers, for long timeouts we ask few workers. And the peak, uh, the best quality is around 25, 30 seconds timeout where we get uh, for the same amount of money the best answers. Okay, so to summarize, it is uh, uh, experiment what we observe is that the first documents a worker does are typically slower and lower quality. They are learning to do the task, so they, the first uh, few ones will be worse than the rest. We saw that judgments which are very quick or too slow tend to have lower quality than something in the around the, the median time. Surprisingly, we observed that inserting these timeouts increase uh, uh, the quality of the results more than just possibly reducing the cost. And if you have a budget, the best timeout for this task is around 25, 30 seconds. So to summarize this, uh, crowdsourcing is expensive because we are paying people. So if we need to scale, one way to scale to limit the cost is to limit the time for the task. And uh, this may also increase the quality. So the question now is why reducing the time increases the quality? And we don't know the answer. We have uh, a couple of hypotheses. One is uh, the flow theory from psychology that it's telling you that you perform best uh, when you are in between uh, bored and uh, stressed status. And that's what probably may happen because of this timeout, right? If the timeout is too short, uh, you are stressed and you are not going to do well. If the timeout is too uh, long, uh, you start to get bored uh, and uh, you don't feel the pressure. But if you use the right timeout, you have the right pressure and you perform best. That's one hypothesis on the why this works better. The other hypothesis is the system one, system two type of thinking, right? By introducing a timeout, uh, you don't allow them to think too long uh, and they have kind of to instinctively give you a label. So they read a bit through the document, time is up, they need to decide. And that seems to give a better quality answer as compared uh, to making them think too long, if you want. Any question on this? Do you think there are other reasons? Yeah, so introducing a timeout gives you this pressure, right? So it's a bit the flow, yeah. Any other question? All right, so let me finish. Um, we talked about uh, crowdsourcing in general, but mainly we focus on paid microtask crowdsourcing and how we use this to build uh, hybrid human machine systems, right? How we can have data analytics, uh, scaling thanks to machines, but also keeping humans in the loop to either pre-process data or post-process the output of algorithms. Once you build these systems, now people are not users of your system. They are a component of your system. 
So it starts to become interesting and there are human factors you need to take into account in designing the system. We talked about malicious behavior, so techniques they use, workers use to get the money attached to the task, uh, not necessarily providing quality answers back to the task. And we talked about the use of timeouts, so reducing the maximum amount of time available for a task uh, to decrease the cost, but also to possibly increase the quality of the labels you get back from the crowd. I did not talk about task complexity, but uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, the talk. Uh, thanks for attending. So capture is a very good example of crowdsourcing, right? The, um, they don't pay the crowd. No, no, that's exactly right. Uh, and Google used the uh, captcha to digitize books, as you may know. And people are not paid. They do it. Uh, the incentive there is to create an account on a system, right? Or or submit a form. It's a really a, a validation, but as a side effect, it creates uh, valuable data. So that's a very good example of crowdsourcing. Today they do it with. Right. Right, right. Exactly. So as you see, you one you once you answer that, you are giving data to Google, and at scale, they collect a lot of valuable data. They can use it to train uh, machine learning models and so on. Yes. Okay, so I think you mainly have two questions. One is, is the timeout, the best timeout the same for everyone or can be adapted? For sure, uh, different people will have different uh, uh, sweet spots, as you said. Uh, we try to find the average best one, probably. I agree that uh, we could do something around uh, adapting the timeout for different workers. The problem is that you need to learn for a worker, so you need to keep uh, observing a worker and probably changing the timeout and try to find the best for him or something like that. But yeah, that's a very good uh, comment. Uh, the second question. Right, yeah, to find it automatically, right. So. Um, what we did here is one specific task. So we are not claiming that uh, 15 or 20 seconds is the best for crowdsourcing. For the relevant judgment tasks and the documents we used, uh, which had a specific length and so on, that's what we found. We need to generalize this to other task types. I believe the effect exists, but the timeout value may be different based on the task you are crowdsourcing. Any other question? Very good question. So Amazon is, a, is an, a nightmare from a tax and fiscal point of view. Uh, formally, how they are uh, recognized is that workers are self-employed people. They get their money as freelancers and they need to pay, deal with their taxes on income taxes on their own. Eh? So Amazon is not an employer and the requester is not an employer. They are um, freelancers in a way. That's the formal vision of that. We've, there is a big ethical discussion around that uh, because there is no unions for them. If they get sick, they get no money, no holiday, no career path, nothing, right? So 
but it's a very interesting development. There is no regulation, but this is growing as a market. So there is a mismatch on support and actual uh, exploitation of these people. Yes. Right. So as a requester, you have two options. Option one is you can specifically ask, I only want workers from US, and you are going to get only workers from US answering your tasks. So you can filter by region uh, as a requester. Otherwise, what happens is the time zone effect, right? If you crowdsource uh, uh, at 5 p.m. here, you will get mainly um, Indian, American, okay. So depending on the time of the day when you start, uh, whoever is awake at that time will come to the task if you put no restrictions. So you can either play in uh, filtering geographical locations or really make an open call and then play on the time zones. There is a clear seasonal effect on the demographics of the crowd uh, working over time. It is the vision, and it's a bit contradicting to Bernstein work you mentioned, because their assumption is short time, high error, and then the more time, the lower the error. We find uh, where 90% of the workers stay, stay, and that's our time for the task. So the hypothesis is the more time, the lower the error, but that's not what we observe, right? The, the, the lower error is sometime in between, and then it goes up again. That's an interesting uh, comparison. Any other comment or question? Oh yeah, that may be. We, of course, didn't uh, measure this, but it could happen. of people who answer. Yeah, we didn't observe any significant difference in the number of participants in the different settings, so we didn't spot any negative effect of the having the timeout as compared to not having it. Uh, but probably when they arrive to the task, they don't know whether there is a timeout or not, so there is no participation bias because of that, I imagine. Thanks a lot. <laughs> well, we had many questions already, I guess. Okay. <laughs> but we'll get the slides.